Hi, my name's Matt Dana, and I'm the managing partner of Dana Whiting Law, and this is my partner, Trevor Whiting, and a lot of people Google Dana Whiting, they want to meet a lady named Dana Whiting, but uh, I'm the Dana, and this is the Whiting, so anyway, uh, nice to see everybody here, and thanks for tuning in. Uh, Trevor and I have done lots of videos in the past about estate planning, we've done a lot of videos about... Uh, um, probate and trust administration and other you know practice areas. Uh, one thing that's really unique about our firm is we do strictly estate planning or probate. So anything connected with the planning process, we also do the administration process if somebody dies. And on the estate planning side, it's really you can break that down into several components, right, Trevor? And what I want to talk about today, I, I think a lot of the material on our website speaks to kind of mainstream estate planning and kind of planning for the masses and what most people need and talks a lot about the pros and cons of a trust over a will and a lot of material there. I want to shift gears today, Trevor, and talk about um, how planning is different with somebody that has a higher net worth. And um, we now have a, a whole separate page on the website that talks about higher net worth. And, and um, I think that we'll eventually post some examples of what we've done for our other clients with higher net worth. But I think one thing, Trevor, maybe right out of the gate, we ought to define you know, what we would consider higher net worth. I mean, everybody has a different standard and sometimes I'm a little bit surprised, um, you know, certain people will call and say they have a very high net worth and, and then, you, you know, which probably in, you know, if you compare it to the average person in the United States probably is a higher net worth. But, you know, in, in my mind, and I'll ask you, Trevor, what you think, but in my mind, I, I take a look at an estate that has significant tax problems. Um, higher net worth people have problems with the estate tax and they have problems with capital gains and and um, my own personal definition of higher net worth would be you know north of 25 million is kind of my definition and I think even to sink your teeth into it you're probably talking about north of 50 million or even north of 100 million right right What's your thoughts on that higher net worth? Yeah, same thing. I think when we, we talk of higher net worth and the difference in estate planning is related to the tax issues. Yeah. And, you know, with the current federal estate tax exemption at 12 million plus per person, um, you know, and, and the IRS actually just released the new numbers for next year. It's going to be close to 13 million per person. Yeah. Then when you have a married couple, you double that and now you're at 25, 26 million, something like that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's those clients that are above that level where we can bring the tax muscle that we have and the experience that we have to help, um, help remove a lot of those tax issues or, or minimize the taxes that would be paid upon upon their passing. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, you and I both know a lot of, quote, you know, estate planning attorneys that, that don't understand tax, right? Um, and if you take the tax element out of it, it certainly simplifies estate planning. But, um, you, you know, I, I want to tell the audience, if, if you don't know or can't guess, you know, Trevor's got his glasses on, maybe I'll get my glasses on, but we are a couple of tax nerds when you boil it down. Uh, in addition to both being attorneys, I'm a CPA, Trevor's an MBA, and we both have what they call an LLM. Trevor, what, you know, do people ever ask you what does an LLM mean? I mean, they see those initials, but I don't think people understand what it takes to get that initial. Yeah, what I tell people is it's a, it's a master's of laws degree in taxation. So it's beyond the normal law degree. And it, it's a specialization program where we went to and studied tax law specifically and, and focused a lot of that, that coursework on estate planning and estate and gift tax and partnership tax and things like that. that impact a lot of our clients. Yeah, so, you know, a person can get an LLM in a different topic, right, or right. different legal topic. 
we have LLMs in taxation and we're both, I guess, proud that we're both graduates of New, New York University, which we think is the, the elite tax program, but right. there are uh, LLMs in our firm that went to Gainesville, Florida, and they might dispute that, right? They argue it, but I think they lose. Anyway, so when we say we are tax nerds, we have stuff to back it up. It's not we're not just self-proclaimed tax nerds. We have the uh, the education to back it. I've been practicing for 37 years, and Trevor, how about you? 15 years yeah. focused in taxes. Long time. Yeah. So what I wanted to talk about today is just so our our our, our, our viewers get kind of a feel for it. What what makes uh, higher end planning much different? And on our website, I think we have posted this latest little article I wrote. It's just a little two-page article, but it talks about estate planning for Thurston Howell III, much different than planning for Gilligan. And I don't know, did you grow up with Gilligan, Trevor? My, I was a Gilligan guy. I did. I, I watched it. You know, you'd get home from school and then turn on the TV, and there yeah. was Gilligan. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, I'm, I'm 66, and what are you, 40? I'm 46. Yeah, so the 20-year period, Gilligan had a pretty good run in he, there. He was on for a long time. But, you know, if, if Gilligan came in here to do his estate plan, the fact that he's not married and has no kids and obviously has, you know, very modest means, I mean, arguably he would only need a very simple will, right? Right. Uh, there wouldn't be a whole lot of planning other than you know, who does he want to give his belongings to and who does he want to put in charge? On the other hand, uh, Thurston Howell the third, right? Uh, we never knew how much money he did have and we knew he had money and, you know, he acted like he had money in a good way, right? right. And had his wife, I think her name was Lovey. But Trevor, before I get into the meat of the article, I mean, you know, maybe maybe rattle off, maybe you rattle off one, and I'll rattle off one. But what 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 stands out to you as maybe a, a factor that makes high net worth a, a different planning process? Meaning the the strategies and tools that we would use, or maybe just the process of even getting to the strategies and tools. Yeah, there's a lot more. We need to jump in and dive in and look at the um, the balance sheet of the client, the the you know list of assets that they own, so that we can get a better idea of what they have, how it's held, how it's structured, and so that we know how to fit it within an estate planning st uh, strategy. Yeah, and you know, on 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 Gilligan, you know, he'd probably come in for one appointment and would design his will, and then he'd come into another appointment to, to sign it. Mm -hmm. On the higher net worth guys, we like to generally have you know five or six one one to one and a half hour sessions, right? Right. And so I would say the big difference, first of all, with with higher net worth is. There's much more, like you say, analysis into the financial statement and much more in the discussion of the different tools that are out there. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, these, these tools on the higher net worth, they are complex strategies, right? I mean, if it'd be simple, the IRS wouldn't collect any money, right? So, you know, by design to save taxes, they gotta be complex. And so, you know, we want our clients to understand these and we want to walk them through that process. But let's start with the balance sheet for a minute. What, what makes a difference of, of what you see on that balance sheet that makes your planning thought process a little bit different? Yeah, you know, different types of assets are going to be better with different types of strategies, whether it's real estate or do they have marketable securities? Is, is most of the wealth tied up in a in a uh, closely held company or you know a family business and and so you know de depending on how maybe there's a business depending on how it's taxed is it an s corporation is it an is it taxed as a partnership uh, might impact what types of tools we can use for that type of uh, yeah, because entity S corporations don't fit in certain types of trusts and right so we've got to right. be very sensitive to that yeah. iras don't fit very well inside of trust without special provisions. Yeah, so we've got to take all that into consideration and, and as you were saying, we like to educate our clients. We like to make sure that they understand these complicated structures that we're talking about and these strategies. And so it takes time to walk through and say, 
this asset could go into this type of trust or this entity and, and move things around and show them the benefits and the pros and cons and risks involved. And so it, it's going to take a lot more time than just sitting down with Gilligan and asking who he wants to be his beneficiaries and you know, who's in charge of his, his estate when he passes away. Yeah, so looking at that financial statement, a lot of times clients come in and they're hesitant in the beginning to release information. They think our fees are, are based upon you know, the size of the estate. We don't charge percentage fees. We charge hourly rate fees and flat, you know, flat fees. But the makeup of the assets, like you're saying, is very critical to what strategy we put them into and why. And, and we'll get into you know, a, f a few of these strategies. But on my drive in to work this morning, I was talking to my daughter, Alicia, over in California, and she was saying how she's referring uh, someone in her neighborhood that's an orthodontist. And, and you know, I got, got the impression that their estate was, you know, probably 20 million and, and it's, you know, it's on the upswing, right? They're making good annual income. And she said, Dad, I'll have to tell you, he, he was saying he was going to do his estate plan on LegalZoom, yeah. right? Now, LegalZoom could do Gilligan's, right? right. Gil, Gil, Gilligan's going to be okay using LegalZoom. It's pretty hard to mess up, you know, who gets my motorcycle and my guitar and, you know, who's going to handle the estate. But an orthodontist with $20 million of assets, if he wants to factor in some asset protection, if he wants to factor in some estate tax savings if he dies, maybe some income tax savings if he sells his practice, needs, needs a little bit more muscle. And that's, that's why you and I enjoy the high end. LegalZoom can't duplicate that, right? Right. Uh, is it okay for me to say LegalZoom? I don't know if I'm going to be sued. I mean, I, 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 I'm saying LegalZoom is good for Gilligan, but I, I don't think LegalZoom is good for Thurston Howe. But uh, anyway, so this, this planning process, they come in. And Trevor, you know that when they come in and, and we're working with them and they sign up for these sessions, in general, we charge a flat fee to have these sessions and to go through all their existing documents and go through all their financial but anyway, uh, Trevor, we're concerned, I think, with two main different sets of taxes, right? We're very concerned about the estate tax. And I, I think people that are watching this realize that the estate tax is going to tax 40% of their wealth over an exemption amount, right? And that exemption amount, what, this year is $12 million and some change? That's right. And it's with tied to inflation, so it'll go up next year to about 13 million, Almost right? Almost 13 million. Yeah. And so, I mean, there you go. Like you said, with the husband and wife, that's 26 million. The estate tax is not going to be an issue. But, Trevor, what's going to happen with the estate tax exemption in the year 2026? And why can you speak with some certainty on that? Yeah, when. Uh when the exemption was raised to these high levels by President Trump, yeah. he only had enough votes in the Senate to make that effective for 10 years. Yeah. And so um, in 2026, the exemption is going to be cut in half. It's going to drop back down. It's going to drop back down. Yeah. yeah. So let's take a guy, let's take a guy, let's take a guy right now with, with maybe, um, let's call it a $20 million estate, Trevor. So if he and his wife died this year, no estate tax, right? At 20 million though, if he died in 2026, you know, seven million for the husband's free, seven million for the wife's free, that's 14. He's got six million exposed at 40%, 2.4 million. So what's happening is the exemption's coming down and you know, there is thought, and we had that thought, that the exemption could come down earlier than 2026. Nobody knows. It depends on the White House and Congress and the Senate. I'm starting to believe that I, I don't think it's going to come down. I think they're going to let it kind of die a natural death and let 2026 hit it and bring it down to seven. But you and I know that some of our key strategies are we can lock in their $12 million exemption. That's one of the big things that we do for high net worth clients. We don't want to sit and watch the 12 million drop to seven. We want to lock in the 12. And the other thing, Trevor, I mean, we hope and believe, and I think most of our clients hope and believe their estate's going to continue to go up in value, right? And generally speaking, I tell my clients, I mean, just roughly, 
the, if they're if they're living off their assets and they're having good uh, you know a good life and good income and traveling and do all the things that we like to do, their their estate still going to double somewhere between every seven to ten years. And you know we get the clients come in and say, oh well, you know that's happened in the past, but it's not going to happen in the future, right? But you know we've been around a long time. It continues to happen exactly. over a ten you know ten year period. So I think that's the biggest thing is how do we lock in that exemption and so that Congress can't take it away. But Trevor, what's the other benefit of using that exemption now? I, I've talked to people yesterday and their CPAs are on the phone and their financial guys are on the phone. And I'm talking about using the exemption now, locking in the exemption now. And they're saying, well, shouldn't we hold it back? Why do we want to use it now and not hold it back? Well, it goes to that point that you just brought up too, that, that those assets are going to keep growing in value yeah. over time. You know, and, and we're kind of in a down market right now. And, and um, but you know, that's probably just more reason to believe that things are gonna rebound at some point. It may take a couple of years. This is the best time to do the planning and down market, do it, right? Do it when the asset values are low, mm -hmm. lock it in at these low values. And then once we do that, we, we lock it in we do that by moving assets into an irrevocable trust. A green box. A green box, we call it. Green's good, and so we move it in, those assets into a green box. And once those assets are in a green box, they're, they're green and they're good and they're exempt from estate taxes forever. Yeah. And so even if that client lives for 10 or 20 or 30 more years, and it doubles and then it triples and it quadruples in value, all of that value is outside of the estate tax system. And, uh, and when they pass away, it passes down to their children or beneficiaries with no estate tax. And you know, even if it's worth 50 million at that time. Right. And you know, if, if you know, readers look at our website, but I have another article on there called you know, Red Box, Green Box. And that talks about the difference between a trust that will be subject to estate tax and a trust that will not be subject to a state tax. And Trevor, is it true I can create a green box for my wife? I mean, when we're talking about, you know, using the exemption, to use it, you have to make an irrevocable transfer of assets to, to some person or some entity. And most people think when we talk about transferring and downloading and gifting, they think we're talking about the kids. And you know they they have enough wealth that they're going to be comfortable, but they don't have enough wealth where they want to start downloading it to the kids. But is it true I can create a green box for my wife? Yeah, it's true. And you know we used to a lot of our planning used to be we'd move it into green box for the benefit of the kids. And yeah, you know, but we we adapt and we get smarter. And as these numbers get bigger with the the, the estate tax exemption going up, now we're talking about moving you know, half of somebody's net worth or, you know, a third of their entire net worth into a green box, we want to give them more options. And so we create a, an irrevocable trust, a green box that can benefit not only the kids and the grandkids and all the descendants, but it can also benefit the spouse. Yeah. And so now if I do that and I create a trust for the benefit of my wife and I, I create this green box, then I still retain or got to choose her words carefully, indirect, I, I indirect get indirect benefit, benefit yeah. if I stay married and, and, you know, friendly with my wife. It's just like, you know, I, I've got a cabin in Pine Top that's in a green box. It's a green box I created for Nancy, but she still takes me to the cabin. You still I still sleep there. It, right? yeah. I, I don't pay attention whether I own it or Nancy owns it, yeah. but it's in a green box that will never be subject to a state tax again, no matter what it grows to, right? right? And so basically, as you know, my my entire estate, half of it's in a green box I set up for Nancy, and dang, she came along and she set one up for me. So nice. So, so nice, so yeah. everything's in green boxes, yeah. and we're happy, we're married, you know? And if we were ever unhappy and weren't married, she's already got half the assets, I've already got half the assets, so you know, it, it, life is good, right? Okay. So that's a good strategy. Now, what about and sticking with the estate tax and then we'll get into some capital gains. That's, this is great strategy and great planning for the guys that are, you know, let's say between 
20 and say, you know, 30 million, right? But what do you do for the guys that are north of 50 or the guys that are north of 100, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of planners that say, you know, you're kind of done, right? You've used your exemption, you've given what you could give, and they may say your only option is to go out and buy a big life insurance policy, right? And that's an option, you know? If, if people want to pay that kind of premium and they, <laughs> they essentially want to prepay the tax, buying a big policy works, but you and I are fairly confident that on you know a, a, a fifty to seventy five million dollar guy, give us ten years or so, we can probably get him down to zero. Right. You know, we can get him down where he doesn't need life insurance, right? So just tell us kind of you know quickly in a nutshell, what do we do for the the guys that are north of of fifty and a hundred? I mean, do we just throw up our arms or what are our options? We don't. We like to get creative and. What we do is we start with that same green box, yeah. and we, we do that. We put the 12 million exemption into it, but now we create that green box as what we call a grantor trust, mm -hmm. and that just means it's ignored for income tax purposes. So if, if this client that's worth 100 million puts 12 million into that green box, the green box is treated as, as the same as the, the client for yeah. income tax purposes. And for estate tax purposes, it's different than the client. It's out of his estate, but for income tax purposes, it's ignored. It's ignored. Okay. Why is that a beautiful concept? That's a beautiful concept because now we can take a block of those assets. He's still million. got, let's say, 50 million, and he's going to sell 50 million of assets to that green box. He's selling 50 million of assets to himself. To himself. But, but, but that green box is out of his estate. So he takes 50 million, puts it in the green box. He takes back a $50 million promissory note, right? Right. That green box is going to make payments back to him for the next 20 years on that note. So what does he achieve over a 20 year period? What he achieves is what the asset that's in his estate when he passes away is that promissory note and it's shrinking over time over that 20 years. It's certainly not increasing in value. It's not increasing in value as payments are made on that note if we amortize it right it, it's shrinking in value and in the meantime that 50 million dollar block of assets is in that green box and it's growing it's doubling every 10 years so yeah. you know it's a hundred years or a hundred million after 10 years 200 million after 20 years and all of that 200 million is outside it's in the green box it's protected and it's not subject to a state tax meantime this promissory note is shrinking and when he passes away if that's been paid off completely there's nothing in his estate from so that we call, side too. we call that a freeze, don't we? Yeah. We freeze the value of his red box and we get the growth in the green box that's benefiting his wife. And now the estate doubles in 10 years, it's still green. And how much exemption do we have to use to set up that freeze? Zero. None. 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 It's beautiful. There you go. All right, we're gonna start slobbering over the table here in a minute, we're gonna get all worked up. Yeah. But so, so, you know, step number one, we call it a squeeze. Step number one, we're squeezing exemption into green boxes. And step two is, once we've used the exemption, now we're going to give away appreciation, estate tax free, doing the freeze, right? Right. And, you know, back to the squeeze, we, we also like to play a valuation game with the assets, right? We're not going to give away cash worth 12 million. We're going to, what are we going to do to squeeze more exemption into that 12? We've got to squeeze 16 into that 12. Yeah, we're going to take this $100 million client, we're going to, and that's why we have to analyze this balance sheet, because we're going to identify assets that we can put into a new partnership. Yeah. And it's a partnership owned by the client still, so he's just moving assets really from one pocket to the other. Yeah. But when we, when we do the gift of the 12 million into that green box, we're going to give a piece of that partnership. We're going to carve off a sliver of it and put that partnership uh, interest into that so green box. So he's not going to give away stocks and bonds. He's not going to give away cash, too easy to value. He's going to give away partnership units that have no voting rights. And what, what does he get for doing that? And we're going to discount the value on that by approximately 30%. 
because of a lack of control, there's no voting rights and a lack of marketability. It, there's not an open market where you can go out and sell these units. That's my article on the website, Trevor. Family Limited Partnership. The GOAT. The GOAT. Yeah. The greatest of all time. So you're telling me I can make a hundred million dollars asset look like 70 million by just putting it in a partnership. That's right. You can make 30 million disappear. I'm loving that. So you're, you're starting to see how we can get a hundred million dollar client down to zero, right? right. We're going to discount the hundred million down to 70. We're going to squeeze of that 70, we're going to squeeze in the exemption into these green boxes. And then we're going to stop the bleeding. The client's not going to grow from 100 million to 200 million under our watch. The growth is going to be in the green box, right? right. I love it. So quite different than Gilligan. Gilligan doesn't, doesn't worry about that. Right? He doesn't need all that. No, he doesn't get to talk about squeeze and freeze. <laughs> so. so, all right. Uh, the, the last step is, okay, we've, we've used exemption. We froze the value of the estate. We discounted. Uh, what do we do now, right? Are we done? We're not done. Not We're done. Not done. All right. So what we do, and you know this, we put in the bottom of this guy's estate plan a formula that says, if I die and the government thinks I owe an estate tax, I never want to pay an estate tax. So you, you, you're the one that named this the washing machine. So tell me what your version of the washing machine is. And it's, it's not technically a washing machine, that's what we call it. But it is a group of strategies we put together and we call the strategy a washing machine. Yeah, what the washing machine does is we've got, at the end of the day, you know, when the client passes away, if the IRS says that there's a, a, you know, some assets that are dirty that are subject to a state tax, then we're going to take those dirty assets and we're going to put them into this washing machine. It's a structure of trusts and foundations and things like that. That we has a charitable component. It's a charitable component. A private family foundation. And it's going to re wash away all of the estate tax so that the family doesn't have to pay a check to the IRS. But instead, the family's going to write checks over time to this private foundation, a, a, a charitable entity set up by the family so that they can do their philanthropy and give to their alma mater their kids and to the be on the board of this foundation the, and it's a good way to teach the kids and grandkids you know to be philanthropic and to be charitable and and give to uh, to other causes and so for a period of probably 15 years the these assets are going to be doled out to this foundation yeah but the growth on those assets is going to be available to come back to the kids and grandkids after the end of that 15 years. Yeah. And so if the client passes away and puts a five million into this washing machine, they pay zero estate tax. That five million would have cost them two million in estate tax. It would have cost them. So the kids would have inherited three. Right. He said, no, I don't want to pay two million. Drops in the washing machine. Now, over, over this 15-year period, $5 million is paid to the, ch the private foundation. Yeah. But then as those assets grow, you know, there may be $5 million left over at the end of the 15 years that goes down to those kids tax-free yeah. as, a, as a second inheritance. So it's basically, if I put $5 million in the washing machine, over 15 years, $5 million has to be paid over to my foundation. Right. But the payments start out very small. So what I'm leaving behind is growing. Mm -hmm. And 15 years later, it all comes back to the family tax-free. So my choice is die and pay the IRS $2 million, or die and put $5 million into a washing machine. 15 years later, $5 million would be in my own family's private charitable foundation, and $5 million comes back to my kids tax-free. Right. Who wouldn't do that, right? It's a win, win, win. So it's called the zeroed out estate plan, right? We wished we invented it. We just named it the washing machine. We just made it clients can understand it. But who, who was the first washing machine that you ever remember reading about? The, you know, a lot of times you'll hear this concept called the Jackie O Trust for yeah. Jackie Onassis. So her estate planners. John put, Kennedy's wife. John Kennedy's wife put it into there. And, and the way they did it, they gave the kids the option of creating the, the washing machine. They didn't yeah. call it the washing machine at the time. 
but the kids actually decided not to implement it. They they paid yeah. the tax and took the money and yeah. and uh, ran. That's why you don't give the kids. We don't. Right to decide. We don't like to give the they, kids they the option. The I don't care how much tax. It's it's new money. We'll pay it. Right. Yeah. Don't give the kids the option. No. We just build it in there. It's going in the washing machine. And what about your buddy uh, Sam Walton, Walmart guy? Did he do the washing machine? He probably did. He did, and it was litigated, and 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 the family won, right? So we now have a blueprint of court cases. You can't look in the tax code and find the washing machine. You can't look on LegalZoom and find the washing machine. But what it is, it's a compilation of four or five different code provisions, maybe four or five different court cases, and then the strategies developed, right? right? Love it. All right, so one other thing that I wanted to get into for a minute was, was the difference in the length of trust or duration of the trust. Gilligan's, Gilligan's going to set up a, a trust maybe for his lifetime, and then on his death it ends, and his motorcycle and guitar goes to, to, to Marianne or Ginger or whatever you know, Gilgan's preference was. Mine was always Marianne, but that's up for another debate. So anyway, but Thurston Howe, he's going to make his a multi-generational trust. His life, his kid's life, grandkid's life. Why does he make his multi-generational? Yeah, the IRS, you know, they're kind of greedy and they like to, they want to get a bite at the apple every generation. Yeah. So they, they, don't, they don't only tax Thurston's, you know, wealth when he passes away, but then he passes it to the kids. They want to tax it when the kids pass it away and yeah. like what, at, you know, at the grandkids level. Yeah, so by the time you get to great grandkids, the IRS has bitten the apple three times. Right. Under so, these multi-generationals, how many times do they bite it? Just... Well, the initial the initial bite, me, you know, meaning the use of the exemption going in right. is going to use up that exemption, and then you know we're going to structure goes from system. kids to grandkids to great grandkids. I don't care if it's a hundred million, two hundred million. Green box. Green box. All right, so that's a big difference. Multi generational trust. Also, uh, Thurston Howell's is going to be uh, more philanthropic and more charitably inclined because of the tax benefits, right? You know, we talked about the washing machine has a charitable component. It has a family's private foundation. But where do we also use charitable components, uh, not necessarily for estate tax planning, but let's shift into the world of capital gains. We say we have a client that's a CEO of a publicly traded company. He's gonna sell off, you know, $40 million worth of his stock, going to generate huge capital gains. What do we have for him? Yeah, one of our best tools is the Charitable Remainder Trust. And again, we like using charity. It's, you know, it's good for, for society, but it, it saves us so much in taxes. And if, if the client puts a piece or all of that $40 million <laughs> of stock into the Charitable Remainder Trust, then when he sells that stock inside of that trust, the trust doesn't pay any capital gains. Yeah. And what happens though is that the, the trust pays back to our client an annuity payment. So each year they get, they get a percentage of the value of the for trust the of for the rest of his life. And so he has an income stream now that's paying, paying out to him. And, and he only pays tax on that income stream as it's paid out. So it defers that payment of capital gains potentially over his entire lifetime, yeah. as opposed to paying it all up front upon the sale of the, the stock. And, and, and at the end of the day, when does anything pass to charity? It only goes to charity after he's passed away. Him so and his wife. Yeah, we set it up for you know client and their spouse, and, and so it pays lifetime interest or annuity to them for their joint lifetimes, and then when they've both passed away, then whatever's left over in that trust goes to probably their private foundation again. Yeah, I just, uh, I just sold my mule to a guy and I was over cleaning out my horse trailer last night and the guy was telling me he sold the piece of land next to him. He sold it on, on contract, right? So he says, I'm gonna sell you this $700,000 lot and you're gonna make payments back to me for the next you know, five or 10 years with usually a good interest rate, right? Maybe eight, you know, eight or nine percent higher than bank rates, right? 
What does that guy get to do with that capital gain? Does he have to pay the capital gain on the sale of that land in the year it sells? Or tell me how that payback works for him. Yeah, that's, that's what the IRS calls that an installment sale. Yeah. And on an installment sale, he only pays the tax as he pay, receives those installment payments over time. Yeah. So if it's a 15-year note, he only pays tax on, on the piece of it as he receives that payment every, every year for the 15 years. And so he gets good deferral of, of taxes, but you can't. And he gets to he gets to invest the deferral of the taxes. He, get, he right? gets to invest that, but you know the that's that's really good and easy to do on real estate, yeah. but it's hard to do with stocks. Yeah, and so the charitable trust makes it look like that, right? Right. It's, instead of instead of selling the stock on installments, which you can't do, you drop it into a charitable remainder trust. It sells the stock. Charitable trust pays no capital gain. But the charitable trust makes payments out to you for the rest of your life, and you pay capital gain on the payments. Right. Pretty sweet tool. And there, there again, Trevor, you and I both know that at the end of the day, if the client lives normal life expectancy and we have normal financial conditions, there will only be about 10% left in that trust for charity, right? right. The family will pull out 90% of it. So what I say is, if you're willing to have 10% go to charity when you die, which a lot of clients are, the IRS is willing to allow you to defer all those capital gains and spread it over your lifetime. I think it's a very good trade-off. And I know there's a lot of you know, uh, uh, models and financial models that will, will you know, analyze different interest rates and growth rates and those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, under normal, what I'd call normal uh, uh, assumptions and normal factors, there's only about 10% left for charity. And it's possible there's nothing left for charity. Right. So there again, on our you know, planning for Thurston Howe, not only are we planning for his estate tax when he died, and we just showed our viewers how we can take a $100 million client and pretty much wipe out the estate tax over a period of time. With Thurston Howell now, he's selling you know, Howell Enterprises and he's going to have this huge capital gain on his stock. We're going to talk to him about the Charitable Remainder Trust. And we don't have time to go into it, but there's also a Charitable Lead Trust and Family Foundations and those things. But understand that that's a difference of, of, of Thurston Howell, right? I think, uh, uh, Trevor, let me say, if you, are you thinking something else here? Let me look at my notes here, but see if, what, else, what else makes Thurston Howe a little bit different? I think, you know, I mean, one of the, the main thing is, is that we, we approach the situation differently because, you know, we, we take a look at that balance sheet, and not only do we see the number at the bottom, but we see the makeup of those assets that we, we, we start looking at it from a tax saving standpoint, and what can we do, what can we plan on for saving taxes and and we focus on estate tax and we focus on income taxes and what about yeah. what tools can we use that are in our tool toolbox to to help these clients save taxes yeah people people say you know you're not a tax attorney they think of a tax attorney as fighting the irs over their income tax right. no we're not that kind uh, no but we're tax attorneys right your right. state tax gift tax capital gains generation skipping these are all taxes that, that we're, we're, we're uh, very well versed on how to save. I have in my notes another difference with, with Gilligan and Thurston Howell is just back to the planning process. With Gilligan, it's just a one-on-one -on -one conversation we have with Gilligan. With, with our higher net worth clients, oftentimes their CPA is in the room. Their financial planner is in the room. You know, maybe they have a life insurance guy in the room. It's much more collaborative, coordinated effort. And a lot of times we involve the the adult children and or, you know the second generation and things like that too, so that because we're setting up a complicated structure that you know we're going to simplify for the client as best we can. But it's good for that next generation to understand that and have some uh, understanding of how things are going to happen as well. And so involving the family sooner rather than later is it can be a, a big uh, benefit in that process too. Yeah. You know, you and, you and I just, we, we just love the high-end stuff. And, you know, the other thing I like about it is we have much less competition, right? You know, estate planning is getting to be, you know, very, very comp 
competitive. Uh, you're seeing commercials on TV now. I was watching CNN the other night, and there's a company called Wills and Trust. And we're seeing that, that banks now do, credit unions will do estate planning, and uh, insurance agents will do estate planning, and online tools do estate planning. And, you know, like I say, I, I you know, you know, planning for Gilligan, you're, you're okay. But you start talking about that $100 million client, there aren't, there's a very small circle of attorneys that swim in that pond, right? The reason there is is because, you know, the average estate planner will never see a $100 million client because a $100 million client's not going to go to the average estate planner. He wants tax attorneys. So how can that guy get well-versed? You know, you and I both know that we got, we got more and more well-versed as, as our clients grew in size, right? You know, in our first, you know, our first few years together, and Trevor's been with me since out of school, and you know, for 15 years, you know, 99% of our practice was kind of, you know, mainstream. You would get a, you know, back in those days, you'd get a client that's 10 million, and that was a big deal, and you know, and you do things that are a little bit more complicated, but. You know, I you know I, I don't I don't think I got my first hundred million dollar client till maybe um, probably about ten years ago, right? right? And then you know then now we've got you know maybe ten hundred million dollar clients, and some of them are north of two hundred fifty million dollar clients. But you start swimming in that pond, and then you're 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 sharpening your saw every day, you know, with these strategies and stuff. In, 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 in closing thoughts, Trevor, is there anything you wanted to add to this list? Or are we calling Thurston Howe? We think we've got him under control here. I think we went through his situation pretty well. I think we got him taken care of. But, uh, you know, he, fortunately he came to the right team. Yeah, you know, he you came go. to Tax Nerds, and, and we've got the experience and he the signed up credentials. For those and, and yeah. He signed did the sessions. And, Educated um, him and, and, you know, helped him understand what the issues were and yeah. what the strategies are to help it. And, Taught him the squeeze and the freeze, and and now he's ready to move forward. Well, and I and I'll just add this in, in clo you know closing remarks. If 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 a client isn't willing to have the sessions, and they're not willing to read and prepare and study and come prepared to the sessions, they're not a good fit for us. This isn't a place where you call up and say, hey, well, how how much is that hundred million dollar client Thurston Howe's plan? How much is that? Well, it's impossible to say because there's so many different variations of how you could structure that. And, and, and some clients, uh, you know, like I said before, some clients, particularly if you've got a very elderly client, and you could have an elderly, unsophisticated client. You know, I remember, I, I remember you know, over the years working with guys that I met them out by the chicken coop, but they had, you know, a gazillion dollars worth of land. And, you know, like it or not, they were extremely wealthy, right? You know, those clients, it, it can be very difficult to get them to comprehend some of these strategies. And sometimes, you know, maybe just buying the life insurance is a good fit. It's simpler to understand, simpler to implement. But it's just that dang premium so expensive. Right. So it's a trade-off. Yeah. All right, well, I hope everybody enjoyed that conversation. And uh, lots of articles on the website that I mentioned. Take a look at them. And uh, we, we offer a free initial consult to come in and see if we are a good fit. And then from there, we'll quote you flat fees. Uh, sometimes clients need four or five sessions, and sometimes they may need two or three sessions. So whatever they need, Trevor, we'll, we'll kind of you know, work on it. Yeah. yeah. All right, everybody have a good day. Thank you.